but my first guest, Nick Buckley, independent mayor for Manchester. See, we don't just talk about London like many other places. We're here to um, uh, find out what you are going to do in your campaign. You've got less than five, seven weeks About now? Six weeks. Six weeks until voting day there. But before I do that and give you a free hit on your campaign, what is wrong with British politics that we've got to this stage? Oh, it's a mess, isn't it? Yes, I, might, I think yeah, we can agree on it's that. It's a mess. Yeah. My answer is we have a lack of leaders being elected to the House of Commons. And this isn't fashionable anymore, but... I blame was joining the EU in the 70s. Once we joined the EU in the 70s, we didn't need leaders anymore. We didn't need states people anymore. We had to actually, though. No, she was involved in politics before the EU came along. So these are the intake since we've joined the EU. And what we've needed from joining the EU was we needed middle managers to implement the directives that came from a foreign power in Europe. And that's who we employed as MPs. Now we've left the EU, it's going to take a decade, we'll start getting a better quality of people wanting to be MPs to get to the House of Commons and start leading Well, the that begs the question, we talked about it a lot yesterday, yeah. actually. Given the, uh, frankly, the horrors of the state of this parliament, mm -hmm. I think it's legitimate to our, you know, and, and, and let me explain that. I mean, what are we on? Prime Minister number three, isn't it? Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, yeah. Sunak. Uh, since the Tories were elected, I think we're on Prime Minister number five, I'm losing count. But, but actually, who in their right mind, above middle managers as you yeah. describe them, would want to go into politics? They're called patriots. We need people who are willing to put the country first, the people first. And if they have to sacrifice their political career or sacrifice their reputation to improve the country, th that's what needs to be done. What we have, we have politicians, career politicians who go, look at this policy, is this going to help me in two years' time to be elected? No, it's not. In which case, I'm not for it. It's short-termism all the time. It's all about the next election cycle. We need people who will put the country but first. People out there are giving up on the two main parties. Yeah. It's not huge, OK, but it's significant. <clears throat> um, they have no chance under our present electoral system of getting elected, though, are they? So, so what, you know, without change, without parliamentary electoral reform is it really going to happen it will happen it'll happen slowly we do things in this country slowly which we should be grateful for otherwise we'll be swinging from one crisis to another crisis politically which we're sort of doing anyway the, f the small parties will influence the bigger parties so the Tories are going to get wiped out and rightly so at the next election They're I'll make a bet with you actually and this is not before I get accused of just being an ex-wicked old Tory I don't think they will get uh, wiped out. They're going to get hammered. They could lose more than they lost in 1997. Yeah. But I think the electoral system will prevent the sort of Canada wipeout that we saw when they went down to five seats. And that's what I'm predicting as well. So when I say wiped out, I mean just before, I mean the Blair election wiped out. They'll spend five years in opposition. They will then have to internally search for, for the soul of the Tory party. What are we here for? And hopefully it'll find a new aim, which is the old aim, and they'll get rid of the West. Okay. We'll, 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 see we'll come happens. back to that, because I'll be talking about um, uh, Prime Minister Sunak getting that fatal vote of... Like in football, when the chairman of the party comes out and says, the manager is brilliant, we love him. I noticed cabinet ministers were out, including Mark Harper today, saying he will lead us into the next election. It doesn't bode well, does it? But about you. Now, yes. um, you stood as reforms candidate in Manchester in uh, three years ago, yeah. I think, when the last elections were there. Uh, I, I think it's probably not unkind of me to say that I think the, the result you got was about 3% share yeah, of the that's vote. Correct. So why are you putting yourself through it again as an independent this time? I go back to the question I answered a minute ago, it's uh, patriotism. I may not win, but as a patriot, someone who loves this country and wants to improve this country, if I don't try to improve it, then who else is going to try to improve it? I may not be successful, um, but if I can then ignite passion in other people who then want to stand in four years, five years' time, and they start changing the country, I'll take that as a win. So, to, in a nutshell, we're in a lift. You've got about 15 seconds. What are your top three priorities for Manchester? 
fix the police. Violent crime's out of control. Because the mayor is the police and crime, crime commissioner, commissioner, just like it is down in London. Is that, and we're catching up to you in our crime epidemic. Um, I'm going to hold a referendum on if, we, on if we actually want a mayor. Most people tell me we never asked did we want a mayor the Greater Manchester. I'm going to give a referendum to see if we want it. And then I'm going to start holding civil servants, top civil servants accountable in Greater Manchester. OK, let's just take the police. Yeah. Fix the police? Yeah. Easy to say? What yeah. do you mean? Um, I've spent two years working with, two decades working with the police. I used to train police officers at one point. Um, I'm going to get rid of the identity politics in the police. I'm going to get rid of the two-tier policing. We're going to go back to basics. Which Does is, the mayor have the ability to do the that? Mayor has and, the mayor I think uh, your aspiration, yep. don't think anyone's <clears throat> going to disagree with you. Does he have the, the ability to do that? He or does. Don't the chief constables decide if everyone goes out and, and joins protests and, and waves flags and he things does, like that? He does, but the chief constable has to follow the strategy implemented by the police crime commissioner, which is the mayor. So I'll be writing the strategy of what I want to see. The day-to-day -day workings will be the chief constable. The only person I can sack in Greater Manchester Police is the chief constable. And if he's not on board, he'll be sacked until I find the chief constable, chief constable with the vision I've got for Greater Manchester. It can okay. be done, it just takes a backbone. And you mentioned uh, the bureaucrats, the civil service, the local civil service that work there. What, what, what are you going to do there? So I can't sack any of them because they work for the councils, they work for the NHS. What I want to do is start naming and shaming top civil servants in the press and start telling the people why our region is run the way it's run. So if somebody wakes a million pounds on a computer system that doesn't work, I'll be naming the top civil servant who signed that off. We've got to start holding these people accountable. I want to give top civil servants skin in the game. They might argue they're not elected. They're just doing the bidding of the political masters. So yeah. it would be unfair to name them. Not when it's incompetence. So I won't be penalising civil servants for implementing policy but implementing policy extremely poorly at a level of incompetence. OK, listen, uh, we've got people calling already. Um, let's uh, let's go to Matthew in Nottingham. Matthew, hello. Hi, uh, hi he Nick. Hello, thanks for calling in. Uh, what That's would you right, like to you. talk about? Yeah, I think just the, the, the complete trust in politicians completely over the last two or three years has just gone from the local, from the general public um, during everything during the pandemic. They've seen the lies, the corruption, the 100% focus on their own worth and their own net worth and things. And the fringe parties just seem to be saying what the general public are thinking. They've got the backbone to say it. That, that, that's interesting. That's, that's where Tr I stand. Tr trust. I can understand you saying trust has gone. But actually, over history, few people have trusted politicians. Mm. Oh, um, no, no, I can imagine. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, never forget, in 1832, when I think Parliament burnt down, I think it was 1832, they all gathered on the South Bank to cheer it as it burnt down. So, right. dis so but, but, but actually, do you... I mean, you might want to vote for someone you trust. You'll, you're Obviously, I think that goes without saying. Yes. But do you think that... That, that that can be fixed. How could we fix it? Because you've got, you've identified the problem. You know how is yeah. how uh, what is uh, what is wrong with British politics? But how could you fix it? Um, I'm I'm just I'm hoping that these that the um, parties like the Reform Party and like these these independent parties that have come about over the last few years, hopefully they do run through with their policies and they do come true on the things that they say. Is about or, or, is about all we can say is to give somebody else a chance. I mean, we've had all of these years of... I know the electoral system, um, we've got two parties. It's really hard for another party to be able to get in. Yeah. But I think we've just got to keep trying and pushing towards that to see if a change will make the change that we want. Je let me just finally ask you, um, do you have a mayor in Nottingham, um, uh, uh, like we do in London and we do in Manchester? Yes, yes, we do, yes, yes, we do, yes. So d what is your view of local politicians, like a mayor? Not necessarily your political uh, view, but do you trust them? Um... I yeah, I probably do. Locally, I'd probably more be inclined to trust our local mayor. I mean, I don't know the powers that he's actually got. He's not got a lot of powers in in, mm. in, in mm. Parliament and things like that. But, um, yeah, I'd be much more inclined to trust a local politician, someone that was possibly from Nottingham and for Nottingham. OK, well, keep listening, because we've got one of those who wants to be mayor of Manchester, which doesn't include Nottingham. My geography yeah, and will no. grasp that one. Yeah. Thank you for kicking the conversation off, Matthew. That's Matthew in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, trust is an issue. Uh, you will no doubt be attacking your opponents, and Andy Burnham in particular, no doubt, not to trust him, I suspect. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Why should they trust you? They shouldn't trust me, because I could just be like everybody else and full of it. 
what people need to do is research people. So look at me online. I have done everything I ever said I would done. Uh, my CV is outstanding of the work I've done in communities. But if you want to build trust in politics, what we need to do is start treating the public as adults and be honest with them. Even when we have to tell them things they don't want to hear, we just need to start being honest with the public. OK, look, you are presenting yourself as a, a serious and substantive candidate. I do want to show you a clip that I don't think helped your cause, but I, liked, I think it tells us a little bit about you perhaps as a, an individual as well. Uh, so this is a clip from your Twitter where you are, you're, it looks like you're doing a podcast with yes. someone and you, you were asked a question about Andy Burnham, I think. So should we just play that? Unfortunately, we can't hear it. That's a shame. Uh, I, always, <coughs> I always love technology, this game. So let me build the narrative now yeah. of, of, of what's happening. You, 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 I know there's a lot of rivalry between Liverpool and Manchester. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Liverpool fan, um, LFC, I get it, I understand all of that. Both great cities. All right. And you were asking a podcast about something about what you were going to about Andy Burnham. You said he's a scouser, right? Yeah. You've got to remember he's a scouser. And what I'm going to do, and you alluded to Trump, yeah. is I'm going to build a wall between Manchester and uh, Liverpool. Yeah. Now, it was a joke. I get yeah. that. And it was quite clearly a joke. But I was fascinated by a couple of comments that were written on the thread after that. When one of them said, Mike... I thought you were going to be a serious candidate. I, um, uh, uh, Mike, did I just call you Mike? Yes, sorry, I get it. Don't worry about it. No, it's important. You need to your name out there, Nick Buckley. Uh, and it actually said, and, and it was basically saying, I thought you were a serious candidate, but I don't want to vote for a bloke who's funny down the pub, I, but I want to vote for a serious yeah. candidate. Do, do, do you regret doing that? No. Or do you think it tells them something about you? It, it may do, it may not do. It was obviously a joke. I'm it was, yeah, I'm not pretending I'm, imperson otherwise. I'm impersonating Trump, a big, beautiful wall, I said. Um, it's rivalry between Liverpool and Manchester, uh, and I could put my date of birth on Twitter, and people would disagree with it and well, have an issue with putting my date of birth on. So I wanted two comments from basically people in Liverpool finding that... I wouldn't say they found it a fairness. Well, I think it was man a fairness. He claimed to be from Manchester. But, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but my point is, you've got a machine against you. You've got oh, yeah, Andy Burnham's yeah. big Labour Party <clears throat> machine. Yeah. You are up against... You're, you're, you're the David. Yep. They're, the, they're the Goliath. Yes. You've got to use social media and everything to get yeah. it over. Um, how much support and advice do you get when it comes to campaigning and what you put out there or are you very much on your own oh i'm on my own so what well, i that's tough and i respect that yeah what i say what i do is all down to me um i think that there's an argument to be made i should be more polished um but then wouldn't i just be a different version of andy burnham well then? i think authenticity is something people are looking yeah, for. yeah and that's exactly what i'm trying to be so i don't censor my conversations i don't censor my language i try to be I try to be Nick Buckley so you know who you're voting for. OK, and fair enough. And that's how you build trust. We'll come on to that and more. If you've got any questions for uh, Nick and you are in amongst... I mean, it's a huge area, isn't it? You take in Bury, you take in to Trafford. Manchester is ten councils. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's huge. a lot. If you're from that area, you'd like to ask Nick a question, now's your chance. He's with me until two o'clock. We're going to be covering lots of uh, national stories and issues as well but you can join the conversation and i'm asking you what is wrong with british politics and you can call 0344 499 1000 i can see some of you are calling already we'll get your calls through this hour and beyond nick the tories were heading for a wipeout ages ago but they had boris who saved them not even boris can <coughs> save them now people feel totally betrayed on immigration nobody trusts them anymore I will vote for reform, says John. Hello, Nick. Crime subject. I have just received my council tax bill. A part of that is the charge for police and crime commissioner. What do they do? Hello. Oh, and then he's repeated, repeated the message. I think you've answered a little bit of that, what you would do, um, because you would be police and crime commissioner. I'll leave others to try and say, what has Sadiq Khan done in London as police and crime commissioner? You might find out with, and you'd be legitimately to, able to ask Andy Burnham that as well in Manchester. Join me, the conversation, 0344 499 1000. 
I'm here with Nick Buckley. He's the independent candidate for mayor of Manchester. We like to get around here and make sure we give as much uh, coverage for different parts of the country and upcoming elections particularly. And there's a question in for you. And if you've got a question uh, for Nick, you can either call or send me a message. You can WhatsApp and call on 0344 for double nine one thousand, or you can tweet uh, at Talk TV or uh, with me at Nick Dubois, and of course you can text the word Talk and your message to eight seven two two two. Nick, please ask Nick. That's you. Yeah. Why not stand as a reform candidate for mayor of Manchester? Says Chris in Ottershaw. I don't know if that's part of your world. You were a reform candidate, of course. I was. Uh, three years ago, I stood for reform for the mayor position then. Uh, that was a marriage of convenience. Greater Manchester Police had just gone into special measures because they were failing. I'm screaming at the TV that someone needs to do something about the mayor for allowing this to happen. And the next day, Richard Tice is on TV saying, and I'm just announcing a new party called Reform UK. And I thought to myself, he's not got a candidate. But why not stand for them again? Because if I look through mm. your manifesto, mm. your pledges, you'd sit very comfortably with reform, I think. Um, when I ran last time, I got two messages off the public. The first message was, when I was canvassing, was, we don't want a mayor, Nick. We've never asked for a mayor. We, were, we weren't told. We didn't vote on a mayor. I'm not voting for you because I don't want a mayor. And the second thing people told me was, I'm sick of all political parties, Nick. I'm not voting for any of you. Well, I think a lot of people will agree with you yeah. here, actually. And that's when I decided, if I run again, it has to be independent and it has to offer the people a referendum on if they want a mayor. Otherwise, I'm turning into what I despise in our political system. Well, listen, um, I've got calls queuing up. I'm going to take those in a minute. <clears> but I want to talk briefly about a subject we're covering later. And I'm asking everyone. I'm going to ask you, Nick. Yep. Leveling up, right? Yep. Big <laughs> flagship policy of the government, absolutely legitimate policy, which I backed in many ways, mm -hmm. which was about spreading the wealth of the economy yep. into parts of the country that have just not benefited from it. Um, and a lot of the north of England felt like that. I was in Hartlepool recently doing a programme. I know they haven't seen the benefits yep. of levelling up, but they would certainly understand why it should happen. Ha according to MPs, only 10% of the money that was meant to kickstart levelling up projects mm -hmm. has happened. Does levelling up resonate on the doorstep? No one in Greater Manchester really has heard of levelling up. It's, it's, it's a new version of the Northern Powerhouse. Um, it's PR spin. And as you just said, they've not spent 90% of the money. If they have spent 100% of it, you still wouldn't notice. What it will take to improve the north of England will take generations. It's about putting in a long-term plan and involving the people of the north. What it's not about is trying to link us to London and making us even bigger beggars from London with our hands out all the time saying, can you give us more money? Can you give us more money? We do know that <clears throat> new roads, new infrastructure drives uh, investment yep. and can drive jobs. That wouldn't be a bad thing in itself, though, would it? Exactly. What we need is HS3. We need a fantastic railway system that connects the north of England. So Does it have to be high speed? Does it? Maybe not, but we need mm. better than what we've got now. It yeah, I think we'd all agree on that. It takes me two hours from Greater Manchester to London. Mm. To get to somewhere like Leeds takes me two hours, near enough. To get past there takes me three, four hours. And it's all a lot shorter than getting to London, um, in miles-wise. We need better infrastructure. We need to connect the north. So people in Liverpool can do businesses easier with Manchester, with Hull, with Newcastle. So people in Bradford can start businesses in Leeds. We need to connect the north of England. Now... Let me ask you, a report was out in today's Sunday Times, I think it was. It was talking about many of our cities, including Manchester, where the commuter trying to get into <coughs> Manchester to work... Actually, Manchester is one of the worst places. In, only one in five can get to the centre of Manchester in half an hour, which mm. was the judgment they would be making. What can you do to improve, the, and I presume this is a responsibility mm. of the mayor, improve that internal transport function? It's nothing to do with the mayor, really. It isn't. The uh, mayor has some influence on it because yeah. he sits on the the committee, the um, Greater Manchester Transport Network Committee. I actually think he's chair, if not he's. But he could be, you could be the advocate for this. You should that, be the champion for well, this. Well, that's what we need. We don't need necessarily need politicians with the power to change because most of them wouldn't have the backbone to do the change. What we need is we need politicians with a backbone, with a voice, demanding better from our public services, demanding better from national government.
OK, well, let's see what others think. I'm very pleased to say. Uh, yesterday we were in Germany. Now we're going to Switzerland. We've got Henry on the line from Switzerland. Hello, Henry. Thank you for hanging on. Yeah, hi, Nick. Yeah. Welcome to the show. What would you like to talk about? Well, really, you're asking about what's wrong with British politics. Absolutely. Big question of the day. <clears throat> and one wonders whether it's because the people have reached such a stage... Um, <coughs> that they feel that they don't have, really have any representation via Westminster. And if you think that some time ago one heard Keir Starmer saying he was more comfortable in Davos, and then you see both Sunak and Hunt neither being elected, and some would say might have been WEF appointees. Now, if you take that sort of conspiracy theory, yeah. well... Then UK politics for both Sunak and Hunt are just stepping stones to their next jobs. Yeah. And what well, are their next jobs? Okay. Their next jobs are WEF type jobs, like what does Sunak want to do? I mean, we well, do. Can I just ask you a question around this? Because, and a, and a clarification, yeah. you're absolutely right. Sunak was not elected by his own members uh, as, pr yeah. as Prime Minister. Jeremy Hunt actually. He was represent. He, you get selected as chancellor without being elected, so I don't think he should stand guilty of that charge. But you know what? Okay. If what you say is accurate about the the World Economic Forum, which is what you're talking yeah. about, this 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 theory that goes around that they're basically calling the shots, you would have yeah. to say every government is uh, uh, is is falling under that uh, spell, wouldn't you, for it to be successful? And that's just not happening. But isn't Charles Schwab, isn't he on record saying they have innumerable appointees in various positions in various governments? Yeah, but so did I in my book, which was a novel, Fatal Ambition, and that, and that was a conspiracy theory that just <laughs> sold books. It didn't mean it was true. OK, though. well, maybe, maybe, but I go and have a look then at policies of the Conservative Party. OK. Can they ever be uh, deemed to be Conservative policies? Well, now no, that is a legitimate they non, question. They are non, non, hold on, they are non-radical policies, yep. which, to my mind, are in order not to upset the future paymasters. Well, so what does Sunak really want? He's got a fantastic. Well, uh, you've asked the question. Right? Let me tell you the alternative theory is that they okay. are not. You are absolutely right. They are not what I would say are core Conservative policies, Henry. But I think they're yeah. there because the Conservatives believe mm. the public now want massive spending and that the government's job is to provide uh, public services with endless amounts of money. Hold on there, Henry. Let's, um, let's ask, what do, you, what do you make of that, Nick? Do you, do you think it is a World Economic Forum-driven conspiracy or have the Conservatives just not become no longer conservative no. Well, it's not a conspiracy because we all know about it and they publicize what they want and they're entitled to publicize what how to influence governments that's how we get change for me we need to go right back to basics democracies get the government and politicians they deserve when the people have had enough and the people start voting differently, we'll have different politicians. Well, we'll I, different I still think the theory <clears throat> there is, is better than the practice because of our electoral system. Henry, thanks for kicking off that discussion. I know many people think um, I don't give time for the WEF theories. I don't, don't believe them, but I give them time, as you can hear. Let's take one more call from Jean in Shropshire. Hello, Jean. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the show. What would you like to talk about? Levelling up, I think. Yes, levelling up in our town means levelling down. Go on then, explain that. At the moment, we have got nine shops that are being refurbished. They're taking away their storage space to put flats above, mm -hmm. and then they're going to knock down seven shops to make a large patio. So your argument is all that's happening is we're turning our town centres into blocks of apartments. Well, no, no, because you know there's only there's only going to be nine nine apartments. Okay, all right. But uh, the, what's it is the the uh, the town the borough council says that it's going to increase our footfall. Now, how do you increase footfall by knocking down seven shops that are already? Occupied. Well, Jean, let's ask uh, Nick Buckley. He's not from your, he's not standing in your area, but he is a local politician uh, on mayoral standards. So, what do you say to that? Jean's point. Yep. You know, you can't, you can't increase footfall, footfall by reducing the number of shops. 
the modern shopper has changed now, so the high street will change. High, well, high streets are dying. We need... Should we let them die? The, to a certain extent, there's not much we can do. Our shopping habits have changed. Well, it, we can. We can start shopping in them. Well, that's an individual yeah, choice. Yeah, but when yeah. you've got a choice, so if it's 15% cheaper online, well, I'll shop online. There must be new life in our high streets. What that looks like, we don't know. But we must allow businesses and entrepreneurs to take risks to try to put life back into our high streets. It won't be the high streets we had 20 years ago. They will change. There will lot of different things. But we need to give someone the opportunity to try Jean, I mean, let me put this to you. That's a load of nonsense. Oh, well, OK. Our little town has <clears> got no empty... or had no empty shops. The footfall was increasing. We've lost one lady that was... Um, well, she, she, actually, she just died, but she gave up her shop um, for the fact that for the next two and a half years, the major part of our town centre is going to be a building site where you can't walk round. Which will be a nightmare for those who have got shops. Well, already got but, shops, Well, yes, Jean, um, let, let me just ask you, though, the people who sold their units or gave they them haven't, up... No, they haven't sold them. Um, they, they, it's, it's, it's owned by the court, the Telford and Reakin district. What, yeah, the they council. They turned to them and said, well, we'll offer you somewhere else in the, town, in the, in the borough. So they were forced out, if you they, like. They, well, yes, they, you know, at th th this moment in time... There, there's, there's just seven shops. Nine of the shops on one side are being refurbished, so there's there's no shops there at all. No. Uh, and then the other side, where the, the shops are still standing, which are going to be knocked down, they're all established. And I've, how can I put it? They're going to be offered places in the other side, which, which after they've been refurbished. But that means that there is seven shops. That we are going to are lose. They, are they, just a quick question here, Jean, so we've got the whole picture here. Yeah. Um, is there a thing called a town plan? Have they actually outlined a plan and vision for the town? It's, um, they, want to, they want to call it a cultural centre. Um, so that where these shops were stored, we're now going to, what I, we, we, the locals call the large patio. It's going to be a paved area with, Tree plantings and mm. well, complaints. if you don't get if you get rid of the shops, I mean, they might be doing it to attract more people in. That will be their argument, as you say, increase footfall because there's other things to do because well, it's a cultural centre. Well, oh, it might be a museum, something like that. I'm guessing. We, we know, it, it, it's, it's attached to the theatre. Okay. But the theatre is a nighttime econo economy, um, mm. so there won't be more footfall through the theatre during the day. Nighttime, yes. Um, we've got plenty of food shops um, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fast food takeaways at night time and pubs. Um, mm. But that's not increasing the footfall... During the day. ...shops during the day. When you've got a full town, you hang on to a full town. You don't suddenly decide, all oh, right, well, we'll just knock this lot down. Um, you can go somewhere else if we can find you somewhere. Jean, you are a formidable uh, putting your case forward. Even I'm beginning to run out of ideas to challenge you. So thank you for that. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to ask Nick a couple of questions on that. But Jean, thanks very much for making that call. If you're also from Shropshire and where Jean is, I'd love to hear from you. But more importantly, whilst we've got Nick Buckley here, independent candidate for mayor, uh, if you'd like to ask him some messages, I've got some more coming in, or you'd like to call 0344 Four four double nine one thousand. My main question of the day: What is wrong with British politics? A lot of you calling in about that. I would. I'd really like to hear from you. Is it simply the electoral system because we can't give others a chance? Oh three four 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 double nine one thousand. Nick, very quickly, you met Jean on the doorstep. I think what the council are saying is, if we put a cultural centre in, a bit of a <coughs> theatre, it'll help draw people in the town. She's got a point there. It's going to be nighttime economy, not daytime. What would your answer be to Jean about that specific issue? So that specific issue, does it surprise me that the council are incompetent and are killing businesses in her town? Doesn't surprise me at all. We need less council involvement in businesses in all our towns and centres because they are job destroyers, councils. The only advice I could give her is she needs people power. They should be setting up petitions. Face it was a Facebook group that stopped Andy Burnham implementing our clean air zone in Greater mm, Manchester. Mm, mm. People, That's a very good point. People power. Politicians will quake in their boots when you've got 30,000, 40,000 people on board to protect That might be a town. struggle in that part of Shropshire, but the point is that yeah. 10,000 there would be pretty impressive. Absolutely. So it should be. It should reflect how many people are there. Yeah, never, it's a really good point. Never forget that many local politicians are elected on very low turnouts. Mm. It's not hard to frighten the living daylights out of them. Even my wife, who's like still grumpy because I wouldn't get involved, 
she managed to force councillors to take, change a planning issue. Uh, in the end, they still built a monstrosity, yeah. but she did manage to get some concessions simply by drumming up public support. Because all they um, care about is being elected again. They do. Right, more of this coming up after the break. Join the conversation. What is wrong with British politics? And have you seen levelling up anywhere? It is a government flagship policy. You know, I'd love to hear some of the uh, success stories. You can join me on 0344 499 1000 or tweet me at Nick Dubois at Talk TV. You can WhatsApp on that same number or you can text the word talk and your message to 87222. Welcome back. I've got to, uh, I've got to read this out. Nick, our king is a mouthpiece for the World Economic Forum. So stop denying their influence on our politics, both at home and abroad. Yet again, you insult the intelligence of your audience, says Anne. And uh, look, we're all entitled to our opinions. I think you're absolutely wrong to say that I'm insulting the intelligence of the listeners when I say, look, I don't buy into it, yet I give it airtime. What is insulting the intelligence of callers or listeners about that? It's debating and giving you my opinion. And if you'd like to voice that opinion, call in. I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, some people think I don't talk about it for some reason, but I think I've just disproved that theory. 0344 499 1000. Let's keep it all constructive and friendly. Um, listen, tell me, uh, I was going to talk about something else, but I just want to touch on this. You were cancelled during the Black Lives Matters um, era of when it was yeah. dominating the news. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, it was June 2020, at the height of BLM, um, and we just had peaceful... Just before or after Keir Starmer was on one knee? Uh, about the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, we just had peaceful riots in London that 27 police yeah. officers magically got injured, and I wrote a blog on my personal site um, talking about their website, Defund the Police, um, overthrow capitalism. One of the most ridiculous things I've heard, yeah. defund the police. But, but the, the worst one for me was disrupts the Western nuclear family, which had me thinking, what the hell is that about? Mm. And what it means is we need less men in the house, less fathers. And that's when I went, no. I've set a charity up, working with kids, stop them getting involved in crime, and they need fathers. So I bought this blog. It went online, it went crazy. People called me a racist and a Nazi. Someone signed up a petition that got 450 votes to have me sacked from the charity I founded. Right. And, there, and according to this, um, that they said that uh, uh, the, the views undermined the Black Lives Matter movement whilst working in a diverse community. Yeah. In other words, criticism or whatever was not tolerated. Well, on a few years, Black Lives Matter now is acknowledged as a grift, as a con. Stealing money. There's all that story about the uh, the leader of it, wasn't it? And well, the funds. most leaders. There's leaders but, of everything. But let's not talk too much right. about that because yeah. but talk about you. Yeah. Because you were, explain it to me. You were uh, removed from the charity. Sacked from the charity I founded mm. by by the board I appointed, who were personal friends. And then and then what happened? Uh, I joined the Free Speech Union. They were fantastic. Um, we mounted a fight back. They got a solicitor involved. They looked at my contract and what I said and went, this is unfair dismissal. So I then threatened individually the trustees with a legal action and they all resigned in disgrace. I then appointed a new board, approved a new board to be appointed at the charity, who then offered me my job back. So <clears throat> I, I don't like talking in these terms. Would you say that was win a win against cancel culture? It was a win against cancel culture, but I don't I, like to talk about win and yeah, lose. I personally I mean. didn't win. Yeah, um, I lost every step of the way. I lost so those how did four it friends. You? Oh, I lost those, I lost four friends. Um, I lost um, the initial bonding with my granddaughter because I was I was a bit of a mess for the first couple of months. Um, I've now can't work in the charity sector anymore now because um, people who work in the charity sector is very woke and it's because like this will come up every time every single time i had to, i eventually had to leave the charity again by my own volition because the charity was constantly being attacked by people like salford council uh, we won't work with you when nick the nazi works with you so i ended up leaving the charity i founded because because of this what do you think about cancel culture Criticism's fine, but cancel culture basically is, is bullying. It's alien, isn't it, to yeah. our very, very strong values that we believe you can have difference of opinions. You can offend people with your opinions. Not allowed anymore. Well, I, 
I'm wondering if we're allowed if we, there, there's a pushback. I do actually oh, absolutely. think there's a pushback. It, it smells in the air. It's been changing now for a couple of years. Uh, there's win and win and win in the papers all the time. And Toby Young from Free Speech Union has done an amazing job with the organisation. He, he, he most certainly does. Listen, I, I'm, I, I do want to throw more on that. I think it's a very interesting story, but I don't have time to do that. What I, what I do want to talk to you about is the national political mm. situation. I'm asking people what is wrong with British politics. Um, the Tory party, I, a week ago... Just No, just over a week ago, I was still of the opinion that however bad it got for the Tories, the last thing they should do is have another leadership election. <laughs> but you've got cabinet ministers, former cabinet ministers and ministers <clears throat> on the record now saying there's dithering in number 10, no decision making in number 10. We hear the Justice Secretary is still waiting for a decision. He's getting frustrated because he wants to either build more prisons or he has to let prisoners out build more prisons mm. by the way we, we've got this uh, the, the the dreadful response to the um, remarks by Hester mm. over uh, linked to the donations I think they are queuing up now waiting for the local elections to potentially topple Sunak mm. I'm not again asking how we got to this place but what 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 does it say to you about the state of politics and leadership in this country that we are on Prime Minister number four and we're plotting months away from a general election? Several things. We have no leaders. We have, a, we have cowards. We have career politicians who put their careers ahead of the nation. And, it make, and what I think the Tory party is doing now, they know it's over for them. What they're trying to do at the moment is, is save the Tory party for their particular split in it. So, Except... Penny Morden put forward as a candidate that the right wing are getting behind because they think that she is the answer and she can unite the party. And, yeah. and frankly, given that she has, even though she's got 15,000 majority, no guarantees yeah. by any means she'll <clears throat> keep her seat, put her in before the election to mitigate the damage. Penny Morden is a great example of why the Tory party are in the state they're in. She's not a conservative. Um, she may win her seat again. It makes no difference who who becomes the next prime minister. Who next, next prime minister before the election? They're done. They're dusted. It's messing with the with, with the chairs on the Titanic. Yeah, I think I don't think that's an unreasonable point to make. Let's go to Cliff in East Yorkshire. Hello, Cliff. Hello, Cliff. Hello, there, Nick. Hello, Nick. Hi. Um, now then, what's wrong with British politics? Yeah, you've only oh, you've only got three hours to answer that. I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, it's, it, it, everybody seems so proud that's an MP of British politics. Well, it's it's a draconian, outdated institution. I mean, they're still working on laws that's, that's three, four, five hundred years old. Uh, name one, name one politician that's a professional in what he does. You know, I mean, you wouldn't get a chiropodist to do brain surgery. So, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that. But are you, you arguing know, for more professional politicians, yeah. Cliff? Well, you need professionals to run the country. You don't. You don't need somebody. I'll give. I'll give you a for instance. Go on then. The minister. The minister for um, uh, neutral carbon. Um, yeah. Now then, I bet if you asked him the question, all these. I live in West York in East Yorkshire, yeah. and it's yeah. a sea, a sea of um, windmills, yeah. uh, generators in the sea. Now then, ask ask this MP that's in charge of neutral energy. Uh, how many days in, a year, in the year does the wind blow on average? But does now he need to know that? Doesn't he just ask his officials? Well, obviously they're not. You know, he's, he's, he should know this to make decisions. Now, you know, they're saying now we're having to get gas to back up the wind power yeah, because yeah. when the wind is blowing. Yeah. To be fair, everyone should have known that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised, Nick. I, I know. Mean, not many people do know this, but. The windiest day, the windiest year in the last decade was 2015. Mm, 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 mm. And it only blew 60 days in that year. Yes, I know. Uh, there was a lot of, a, a lot of reports. That, but Cliff, what, what, I don't think you can necessarily... I mean, we can make the case for professionals in certain areas to stand for Parliament. But the idea that we, we actually only have someone who is a, a doctor becomes health secretary or a, a, a former army officer becomes defence secretary, I do think is flawed because we're suddenly saying only certain types of people can be elected. Ho hold on there, Cliff. We'll ask Nick what he thinks. 
I agree. We don't need less... Well, with, with, with Cliff or me? With, with, with you. That are very wise. <laughs> we, we, we don't need less people making decisions in our country because we think they're specialists, because most specialists over time are proving to be wrong anyway. We need to open up the debate. We need to involve the British public in making decisions. Because but not referendums for every big decision, no, no, surely? No, no but, no, but but there's different ways of involving the public to make sure that they're heard. Because the more heads you get together to help make decisions, the better answers you get. And the more the, the, more the public agree with those answers. Running a country is not easy. There's no simple solution. There's no perfect system out there. We have this system. We've got to make it work for us. OK, Cliff. Nick. Yeah, yeah, go on. Just, just, just one final point. You know, this, the, the, the reason I'm saying this is because there's, there's not much leadership within, within the MPs. Agreed. System. And, and it's, it's all falling back on the, um, on the civil service. Now then, they, everybody's moaning that they're getting too much power and they're not doing what the government's telling them. They're not doing as government's telling them because they're leading them down a dark, a, a, a dead end street. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do, I do think, I do think your point about competence, which I do totally accept. The only debate we can't have it now, unfortunately, Cliff, is that in a way, the idea that in our parliament anyone can stand and may end up running a big government department of which they've uh, the only thing they've ever run in their lives before is a bath, as I uh, say, is in a way both a strength and a weakness of our democracy, Cliff, because I'd love you to be able to stand for Parliament or any of our callers rather than just narrow the field. I think that's, the, that's where I struggle. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But the thing is, is I, I, I've lived in Spain for six years and Greece for three years. And I've, I've only recently come back from Spain and they're absolutely laughing their heads off at this country. And it, it's... What are they laughing about, it's, do you think? How it's run. Mm. You know, it's, it's worldwide now. It's on the television and, and, and they're all there jumping up and checking papers and, and, and speakers saying, oh, calm down, calm down. Oh, you mean the institution. What? Yes, the institution. Yeah, it, it, to many people, yeah. Cliff, it, your, your fair point, to many people it looks archaic. Now, I'm, I'm going to do this, it's really naughty, but I wrote a book called Confessions of a Recovering MP. The reason I'm telling you is it starts off, Cliff, with precisely your premise. This archaic system is bonkers, but by the end of it, I hope I've proved it can still work. Cliff, lovely to talk to you again. Thank oh. you very, very much indeed for joining us. You must join this conversation because you make this show what it is. 0344 for double nine one thousand. So you're going to go back to Manchester, Nick. You've got seven weeks. How well are you going to do? Um, who knows? Uh, I've been, see, you've been a politician already. Well, Come on. Well, well, <laughs> well, if we're based on social, I'm teasing you. if we're based on social media, I'm going to win. Yeah, unfortunately, well, there, is a, there is an analogy. In 2015, I thought I was going to win based on social exactly. media. Exactly. So, so I've learned from other people that you don't base your predictions on social media. Is it costing a lot? Though? It's. I mean, time, obviously. I've, t I've taken a year off work. Yeah. So I've, 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 donate, I've uh, donated a year of my time on there. I've been working on this now 12 months. I'm funding nearly all of it myself. But it's not about the money. So it's about giving people the choice of in Greater Manchester that we, we can get better. But to Got get a better, quick question for you. On. I'm only cutting you off now there because does Nick love the UK's history, values and belief which these days seem to have been lost? This is from someone who's born in Lancashire but I think might live near, it might be in your area. Yeah, of course I do. This is the greatest country in the world. It may not be the greatest as in this hour, but if we look over slightly longer term, this is the greatest country that's ever existed in the history of this planet. And the history books will tell you that. Nick Buckley for PM, a patriot and courageous, says Barry. Well, one, one step at a time. I think, I, think, <laughs> I think it's quite interesting. I'm getting a bit of a response also to uh, your legacy of being cancelled, which... Mm. Um, you know, I, 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 I could sp spend three hours talking about mm. that. So, uh, Nick, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Nick Buckley, the independent candidate. I've been promising he, he could come on for a few weeks and we've managed to deliver on that. If you like that video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell and comment. And if you like what I'm saying about running for Mayor of Greater Manchester, then stick around, tell your family, tell your friends. The only way I'm going to have a chance of winning is a grassroots movement. So be part of that movement and hit that bell.
thanks.